So drugs affecting cholinergic transmission. As you know, the central nervous system is split. Uh, the nervous system is split into the central nervous system and PNS. As pharmacologists, in this video, we'll be looking at the autonomic nervous system and uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of it. So as you know, sympathetic involved in flight and fight, and parasympathetic in the rest and digest. Now, the highlights in the yellow is the take home point from it. The ANS, the autonomic nervous system, is concerned primarily with the visceral function. So most organs of the body, such as the heart, respiratory system, digestion, GIT, and various other organs, are not in control of our brain. So they kind of work by themselves. So drugs affecting these is what we're going to be talking about. So the morphology of neurons in the ANS include, so in sympathetic, we have the Neurons start from T1 all the way to L2, whereas in the parasympathetic, parasympathetic includes cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, as well as S2, S3, and S4 sacral regions. Now, the main take home points from here is parasympathetic neurons are uh, the sympathetic, usually relays onto a sympathetic chain known as a sympathetic ganglion, and then onto the from there onto the, uh, the side organs or whatever it is. So this is known as postganglionic and preganglionic and here it'll be preganglionic and postganglionic. So in the parasympathetic the preganglionic, i.e. before the ganglion, is quite long and the postganglionic short and vice versa and the sympathetic. So it's short preganglionic and long postganglionic. What I want you to remember clearly from this video is acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter for parasympathetic preganglionic and postganglionic and sympathetic preganglionic so if you don't have if you don't understand exactly or I'm speaking too fast pause the video and look at the arrows indicated on red red and blue whereas in the postganglionic sympathetic nerve it's done by norepinephrine other neurotransmitters include dopamine which is released mainly in the renal vasculature in the sympathetic system and adrenal medulla also releases norepinephrine now, cholinergic receptors can be split into nicotinic and muscarinic. For your information, I've only wrote down uh, muscarinic mainly. Nicotinic are found in nicotinic NM and NN. NM found in CNS and NN mainly in the skeletal motor plate. So, the ones I've highlighted or seen on screen are M1, M2, and M3. There's M4, and M5 found in CNS, but not so important. M1 is mainly located in the gastric glands, salivary and lacrimal. M2 mainly in the heart and M3 located in the GIT system, eye, salivary, exocrine glands, genitourinary and respiratory system. The M2 receptors work by a G protein coupled receptor inhibitory mechanism so excitation or acetylcholine release or activation of a uh, muscarinic M2 receptor would lead to decrease heart rate since it's an inhibitory so therefore the SA node and AB node will be decreased firing rate there will be decreased heart rate, decreased excitation and decreased conductance pause this video now and kind of by heart both M2 and M3 M3 is really important because it's widely distributed throughout the whole body now M3 works by a GP, G protein coupled receptor GQ this time it's an excitatory effect how these G protein coupled receptors works. I'm not going to go into detail, you would have to do further research by yourself. But in the gastric and salivary glands, if they have excitatory effects, there'll be increased secretion of the gastric and salivary, lead to increased secretion in the gastrointestinal tract. There'll be increased contraction of the smooth muscles, leading to increased peristaltis, as well as relaxation of sphincters, um, such as lower sphincter, sphincter, etc. In the airways and stuff, there would be. Um, in the airways, there will be increased contraction uh, of the bronchi uh, bronchial muscles, so therefore there will be um, bronchoconstriction in the genitourinary, as so you can see in the image here, in the genitourinary tract, there will be contraction of the detrusor muscle and relaxation of sphincter, leading to increased secretion. In the eye, on the other hand, there will be um, in the eye on the other hand there will be meiosis and accommodation and the effect of it is increased decreased intraocular pressure which you would need to remember later on in this video now natural drugs affecting acetylcholine acetylcholine is usually formed in the pontomesin 
pharyngeomental complex in the midbrain, so in the pons. Um, you can also find it being formed in the nucleus basalis as well as the septonuclei, and then it's transported all across the different parts of the brain. Um, so these are all involved in the midbrain, mainly involves all the autonomic nervous system as well as the fornix and the cingulate bundle. Now, on screen you have a presynaptic neuron. So these drugs are the natural effect, ways of affecting a cell transmission. These are still under scientific research, so they're not exactly entirely sure if they're correct or not. Hemicolamines, so the basic normal way of acetylcholine works is acetylcholine gets transported through a vesicle and end exocytose into the presynaptic cleft and then post binding to receptors acetylcholinesterase receptor uh, enzyme breaks it down into acetyl-CoA and choline. Now choline gets transported back into the presynaptic neu uh, membrane, presynaptic neuron through a transporter. Hemicolamines can block that. Vesamical usually blocks the vesicle production, so acetylcholine cannot be transported, and botulinum toxin acts on mainly the two key words of VAMP and SNAPS. These are proteins found in the exocytosing area of the presynaptic neuron. So when you block them, the vesicle cannot bind and exocytose. Now, the main three takeaway points are hemicolonemes, vesamical and botulinum toxin. Pause the video to find out exactly how they work and move on after you've understood it. The pharmaceutical interest of drugs would include receptor agonists and antagonists or receptors, i.e. here, muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. So if you have agonists, they would potentiate the effects, so they will cause more of the same effects as acetylcholine. Um, the antagonists would block the receptors, whereas inhibitors, or you could indirectly increase the amount of acetylcholine in the presynaptic cleft by blocking the acetylcholinesterase. So these enzymes are not breaking down acetylcholine because they're not functioning. Now. We have drugs affecting cholinergic transmission directly acting or indirectly acting. Directly acting basically simply means non-selective drugs acting on both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. These include carbocohol, acetylcholine. So you pretty much have to think about the effects that acetylcholine brings about when they act on M1, M2, M3, M4, M5 and nicotinic receptors, which were mentioned previously in this video if you rewind and watch. Now, cholinesterase inhibiting drugs are the main ones. These can be split into reversible and irreversible. So reversible can be split further into tertiary and quaternary. Quaternary being well, very poorly absorbed and does not cross the blood-brain barrier, whereas tertiary can cross the blood-brain barrier and are well absorbed. Examples include galantamine of tertiary and donopisone with stigmine, whereas in quaternary, renostigmine and periostigmine. These Tertiary ones are used mainly in Alzheimer's disease since they can cross the blood-brain barrier as well as atrial intoxication. Irreversible drugs include parathionamethone, which are organophosphates, and chemical nerve gas somin. The main point of to remember is you have an antidote, i.e. if you have intoxication of too much of any of these drugs, so i.e. there's too much acetylcholine in your uh, system and in the cranial side of the cleft and causing various effects, the antidote to remember is obidoxine. I've not written it down for some odd reason, but remember obidoxine, O B I D I X O, O B I D I X O M E, obidoxine is the question, antidote. Now, what are the clinical effects when these drugs act? So basically, think about all the effects that the receptors do. So the mechanism of action of the receptors, whether they're inhibitory, excitatory, GPC, GI or GQ or GS, whatever they work by. So in the eye, these drugs, i.e. direct and indirect acting ones, like such as carbocol, estacolene, tertiary, rivastigmine, galantamine, etc. These all cause meiosis accommodation leading to decrease in drug pressure. So therefore, they can be clinically used in glaucoma. Glaucoma is opposite when you have I increased intraocular pressure. In the heart, they will lead to bradycardia. In the respiratory, they will lead to contraction of smooth muscle. And in the GIT, there will be increased stimulation and stuff. In urinary bladder, again, stimulation of the detrusor muscle. Pause the video and can kind of memorize. Don't memorize this. Understand the concept behind it by understanding where these receptors are found and how these receptors act due to the mechanism of action. Once you understand that, this will be easy to understand.
and clinical uses of these drugs include in the eye it can be given for glaucoma the contraindications are indicated as red and yellow is the clinical use in the GIT it can be used as clinical post of ileus ileus basically means a distension of the small bowel or the large bowel usually so in post operation the muscle might not be have healed correctly so therefore there's decreased peristalsis so by administrating these drugs you can increase peristalsis or something increase but they're contraindicated in peptic ulcer disease since these drugs cause increased acid secretion which would further worsen the condition in urinary bladder so someone with urinary retention problems you can give these drugs because they kind of increase the muscle the truth of muscle contraction as well as decrease uh, causing the sphincter to relax and myasthenia gravis as well. Oscarinic agonists include, there's only one example, pinocarpine, which is a plant alkaloid mainly used for glaucoma. Muscarinic antagonists, so these antagonists, so they have opposite effects of what we just said, the carbocohol and everything has. These include atropine, semi-synthetic include butyl scopolamine, Synthetics can be split into bronchospasmolytics, mitriatics, and urospasmolytics. Mitriatics include psychopentaloate, bronchospasmolytics, and urospasmolytics. Semi-synthetic are usually going to be used for gastrointestinal and biliary renal colic since they are antagonists. So there will be decreased movement and decreased enteric nervous system firing, so therefore decreased pain. Colic means pain. Now, in bronchospasmolytics, can be used for these are antagonists. Usually, acetylcholine will cause bronchoconstriction. So therefore, bronchospasmolytics would lead to can be used in bronchial asthma and COPD. Examples include improtropium and teotropium. Urospasmolytics are oxybutynin and sulfonylurethrin. So people with urinary incontinence, i.e., people that are urgently always wanting to urinate. Atropine is the one that we're going to go in detail because it has various effects. Now pause the video and kind of learn the clinical use of atropine. Because it can be used clinically, they call, atropine causes opposite effects of what acetylcholine would have caused in the eye, heart, respiratory, digestive system, and genital urinary. Just to go over them, it would cause mitriasis. Mitriasis is seen here in the image. Meiosis is basically when the pupil is very small, so there's decreased intraocular pressure. Whereas in mitriasis is when the, you're trying to increase the amount of light that enters your eye, so there'll be increased intraocular pressure. Why this is useful in clinical? Clinic is because you can be used in ophthalmology. You can be used in ophthalmology to learn the anatomy of the eye or whatever for the ophthalmologist to look at the eye. Blood double vision. Now, cycle uh, mitriasis could usually mitriasis is the opposite of what is alcoholine would do, which is meiosis. Now, in the heart, it could be used for sinus bradycardia and acute MI, but too much administration can lead to tachycardia. Digestives in the respiratory, muscle bronchial muscle relaxation, bronchial gland, decreased secretion of histamine. Digestive system can be used as a spasmodic agent, but can lead to dry mouth and constipation because of decreased salivary glands secretion. In the genital urinary tract, again for spasmodic agents. And pause the video to learn more about the CNS and read about it. Last but not least, drugs affecting nicotinic receptors include agonists of nicotinic receptors and antagonists. Agonists are cysteine and nicotine used for smoke, decrease uh, to inhibit smoking sensation. Now, anta antagonist and uh, nic antagonists of nicotinic receptors are the main ones. Remember, these can be split into neuromuscular blocking drugs, which are deep, non depolarizing or depolarizing. So, on the right, you have an image. Where it says deep non depolarizing, such as propocunium, atrocurium, basically both work as competitive inhibitors. They bind to an area in the receptor, causing um, the channel to be blocked and not open, so sodium cannot flow in. So, therefore, there is a all or, no, uh, all or nothing principle threshold is not fired, action potential is not caused. They can be used in surgery, muscle relaxing effects. The other depolarizing could be succinamethasone, which is. A non competitive binder, so it's a it binds to both the outside and inside, causing a conformational change in the shape. So, therefore, it the gate remains open. So, now the receptor becomes insensitive, or you can't cause sodium to cause because the blockage from the small gap. There are two ways it can affect it. Usually, the normally what would happen is the, the, the 
gate remains closed and lagging is common, such as acetylcholine or carbocohol, which is a pneumatic binds to it, opens the gate flow of ions, causing its action potential. So non-depolarizing is a competitive and depolarizing is non-competitive. The example of no depolarizing is succinium and non-depolarizing is pipiconium and atropinium. Thanks for watching the video. Please don't forget to subscribe.